Hey everyone, and welcome to this eighth video in a series of seven um, that I felt I really had to make because this whole discussion of inner reconciliation would be woefully incomplete without me paying proper homage and respect to non-duality. Now, many of you know me only as a non-dual teacher from satsang and the like. But the fact is, inner reconciliation simply would have not been able to come into being were it not for me running across Advaita, Vedanta, and Zen. For that's what tied the whole thing together and put a bow on it. That's what showed me the timeless, formless being that was the true identity of original innocence and eventually led me to putting all the final pieces together that became inner reconciliation. One of the most important things to grasp in this whole exploration that I've been leading you through is this. When we're talking about conditioning and original innocence, it was not the original innocence that got conditioned. It was never that the real you got conditioned. What happened is you identified with the conditioning. So let's take one more look at what conditioning is and what identification is. Conditioning is adaptation. It's a word that designates the sum total of all the functions of the body-mind complex conforming itself to the environmental conditions for the express purpose of surviving, survival at any cost. The cost in this case is your soul, <laughs> your authentic self. But from the point of view of survival, that's a fair trade. I mean, if you're dead, all the rest is a moot point, right? Now, identification literally means to make identical with, to become the same as. So you, the conscious being that is animating this whole thing, makes itself identical with the conditioning. That is, you took on all the functions of the body-mind complex as yourself. In other words, you swallowed the blue pill of I am the body-mind conditioning. Now for the nervous system, conditioning is totally natural. It's what it was intended to do, adapt. But with the advent of identification, which is unique in human beings, it no longer is merely a system of adaptive patterns and programmed responses. It is myself. This is the fall. This is the creation of the sense of separation. This is the energy pattern that will eventually become the ego mind. And unless one awakens to an understanding of this whole mechanism and how and why we identified with it, it will continue through your entire life and even beyond. Let me put it this way. GP was not conditioned. GP is the conditioning. GP was merely the name given to this particular set of highly complex and automatic functions. Substitute the name GP for the name you go by, and you'll get the point. Even your name is the conditioning that you took on as your own. That is, you made yourself the same as. This is the I am the body belief. Now, when I say that, I'm not just referring to the physical structure, but to the entire functioning of the system the physical structure of form and sensation, the emotional structure of feeling, and the mental structure of mind or thinking. So when you believe you are the body, you are believing I am the physical form, the race, gender, age, ethnicity, height, weight. You're also saying I am the mind, the beliefs, concepts, cultural biases, memories, aspirations, ambitions, prejudices, judgments, morality, religion. And when you're saying, I am the emotions, the hates, loves, 
fears, desires, sensitivities, indifferences, reactiveness, hope, disappointment, frustration, anticipation, all of the emotional ups and downs, the pain and the suffering are me. When you're looking at your life, you are actually looking at the history of the belief, I am the body, the whole story in memory. The development, the evolution, the shifts and changes, the growths, the successes and failures, the traumas, all the ways in which that fundamental belief, I am the body, has shifted and morphed over the years as it encountered the shifting tides that is the very substance of living. Now, just as an aside, extrapolating beyond the individual, it's exactly the same process for a group or a culture the body politic, as it were. A bunch of individuals, all believing they are the body, sharing common beliefs, prejudices, and ideals, myths, and stories unique to their conditioning, create a cultural or social body. And like the survival instinct of the individual body, it will do anything to protect it with that same fervor the physical form has when it's threatened. And so, Good people will do evil things, and an entire world can go stark raving mad. So now you understand why the world is the way it is. It all comes down to, I am the body mind. Now, <clears throat> while we have so much in common with every other critter on the planet, there's one thing we don't. Our conditioning, even though we believe it to be ourselves, feels uncomfortable, and we try to figure out why. The first indication that we may have, that we may be more than just this body-mind complex, is when we start to feel frustrated. Despite this formidable power of adaptation, we intuitively feel something is off. I often use the metaphor of the whale in the swimming pool. Take an animal that is in its natural state, is wandering around the whole world and put it in a tank. Even though that animal can't reason or evaluate or figure out what's off, it knows something is off. It doesn't know what, but something is definitely rotten in Denmark. Another example is the caged lion. In the wild, lions routinely wander about 10 or more square miles a day when they're on the hunt. Put that animal in a cage 75 feet long, and what does it do? It walks from side to side. Its natural behavior has been stilted, but not eliminated, and it knows something is off. So do you. But our great human advantage is we can figure out what. You are that caged lion. You are that whale in the swimming pool. And your trainers keep telling you this is the way it's supposed to be. Moreover, you get told that you need to get rid of that uncomfortable feeling or negative emotion. <laughs> Truth is, that quiet, persistent, and often annoying voice is the voice of original innocence. It is the voice calling you from some place that seems to be beyond, but is really deep within you. This is the true voice of your soul. But the conditioning is strong, and so this voice, at first, is always misinterpreted. We mistakenly believe that we must reach for something out there to get it to be quiet. Moreover, we get convinced early on that when that discontent arises, it can and should be eliminated by more toys in the swimming pool or maybe nicer furniture in the cage. Or maybe you just need help adapting better to your cage. That leads to personal development, success strategies, self-help, and even spiritual seeking. The ultimate mission of inner reconciliation even while it's extremely effective therapeutically, is to set the stage for the ultimate reconciliation, your reunion with your soul, your authentic self. It's turning the attention back inward, towards the place where you actually are. 
it turns your attention away from out there, where there is no answer, to in here, where there actually is an answer. Like Moses turning towards the burning bush, it turns you towards that annoying voice. So here's the big question. The question that all the conditioning and all of your enculturation has served to avoid and obscure. If I'm not the body, what am I? And this is where non-duality enters the scene. Inner reconciliation, in terms of process and practice, draws much from various metaphysical and psychological techniques. Yet it couldn't have happened at all if it had not been for my discovery of and complete immersion in Advaita Vedanta and Zen. It's from there that it draws its authority, its power, and its remarkable gentleness. So how do you come to know who you are when everything you thought you were is found to be wrong? We know very well how to explore the external world, but how do we explore the world within? Well, the great Indian sage Ramana Maharshi put it simply and beautifully, go back the way you came. Or, in the words of the sage of Nazareth, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is original innocence. So let's do that. Let's go back before identification happened, where you are just pure being. You just are. In fact, there's no you, no me, no them, no GP, unidentified, undifferentiated, not the same, it's not different. It's not two at all. It's totally non-dual. So close your eyes for a moment and just feel. Just let go of everything. Let go of the, uh, the pictures around you. Let go of everything that's happened today. Even let go of everything I've said so far and just tune in and feel your body. Just like we did in the other exercise, just feel the body. Now notice that the body, from your experience, is a continuous flow of sensation. Now for you, the little child, none of those sensations have any names or meaning. They have no associations. They're not judged or categorized. They're not compared or contrasted. And notice, you need no words to feel. Pure experience. This is pure awareness. It's that simple. This is undifferentiated consciousness. This is original innocence. Some sensations feel different than others, yet there's this wholeness to them. Some feel better than others, but this is not a mental judgment or evaluation. It's a natural discernment of character and quality. And once again, doesn't need a word. You just know, without labels, without categories, without names. This is pure isness, pure beingness. This is the undifferentiated state. So simple. This is Sahaja, the natural state. Notice, it's been here the whole time. It's simply been covered over by thinking, obscured by conditioning. You can open your eyes now. 
No matter what the particular conditioning you received was, this was there prior, and as you just saw, it's still here. Now consider this. Everyone watching this is smart enough that there are many things you could do or could have done with your life. You, you could have been a holistic, a holistic practitioner, or maybe an engineer, or a small business owner, an artist, a salesperson, an actuarial. You could have done any of those things. And as a result of that, you would have conformed yourself, your knowledge, behaviors, your thought patterns, your feeling states, your sense of identity accordingly. It would not have affected that original innocence. Now, right now, there are many people in many different walks of life watching this, and you all felt that original being. Nothing you do changes its essential nature. It just gets put into a container. The whale is still the whale. It's just been put in a swimming pool and is adapting as best it can. Your real nature, your real authentic self is that formless, undifferentiated, pure being awareness. It's only been temporarily confined to a container, but that confinement never cost it its true nature. The container is identification. What's the shape of water? It has no shape. It has no form. It assumes the shape of whatever you put it in. What's the color of light? None. It is invisible. It is the potential for all color, but it itself, in its wholeness, is no color at all. So, taking away all the thoughts of identity, just completely eliminating all thoughts about yourself, just nothing but that pure experience. What do you have? When we think of ourselves, usually, we immediately associate me with some form, some physical, mental, or uh, emotional characteristic. But those are the container, not you. How can you think of the formless? the water that can take any shape. How can you think of yourself? The answer is, you can't. <laughs> you can't think of you. Every single thought you have is a limitation. It's a reduction. You can't know you at all. You can only be you. You're like invisible light, the potential for anything but in itself is nothing perceivable or knowable. It's reflected everywhere, but it can't be seen. You can appear as anything, but in your wholeness, you remain a mystery. This is why non-duality seems so arcane, so strange sounding, so downright weird. Inner reconciliation is my attempt to make it exceedingly practical. It is a means of breaking our habit of identification with thinking. Not to replace it with a better version of yourself, but to replace it with nothing but yourself. As Nisargadatta put it, abandon false ideas, that is all. There is no need of true ideas. There are none. You, the pure water, are not confined to any container unless you believe you are. You, the pure light, are not limited to any one color, unless you believe you are. You, the formless, unconditioned, authentic self, are not confined to any identity, unless you believe you are. That belief, I am the body, and the resulting identification is the great mischief maker. It's what keeps us confined in our beliefs, confined in this identity. 
believing it to be true, we create our lives filled with lack, limitation, fear, and suffering. We're the whale in the swimming pool. But unlike the whale or the lion, we can wake up and free ourselves from the cage. All you have to do is see that it's not a real cage. It's one that has been constructed totally from false beliefs. Abandon false beliefs. That is all. <laughs> the ultimate reconciliation then is a discovery. It's a liberation. Liberation from the false and a return to the true. You were never really divided up in the first place. You were just confined to a very small container and you made one simple mistake one error of judgment, thinking you were the container and not the water in it. Because of those early wounds, we became disconnected, alienated from ourselves. Some aspect of the light were, were simply not allowed to shine. And so they were sent off to the dark place. It's as if you were covered in a filter and only one or two colors could could make their way out. Inner reconciliation takes off the filter to let you experience and see the fullness of your light, to let it shine completely. But notice, we didn't give you back any light. We're not filling up an empty tank. We're simply revealing the light that was there all the time, but did not have permission to come out. We're loving ourselves out of the container to be restored to our rightful place as perfect, whole, breathtakingly beautiful. And look, isn't that what we have been seeking for our entire lives? That reunion with ourselves? Thank you all for indulging in this last video. The discussion of inner reconciliation would not be complete if I didn't pay homage to its real source and power. Here's a quote from the great sage Shankara, regarded as the father of Advaita Vedanta or non-duality. That which permeates all, which nothing transcends, and which, like the universal space around us, fills everything completely from within and without. That supreme non-dual Brahman, that you art. Thank you again. May all beings end suffering and be happy. Blessings and Namaste.